saying that my colleague Bill Chadwick can't be here this week. He's actually at another conference in the state, so I'm going to be presenting um, both of our work today. Um, this work, uh, Geoarchaeology at the Squirrel Hill site in North America, um, this began as a uh, stemmed from an archaeological field school through the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So our overarching goal, of course, was to train uh, undergraduates and graduate students in archaeological field techniques. Um, but we were also partnering with the Archaeological Conservancy. So the Conservancy is a nonprofit group that uh, uses donations um, and funds that they've raised to purchase lands that are threatened, or sites, I should say, threatened by development and looting and that kind of thing. And so Squirrel Hill was one of these heavily looted sites in Pennsylvania. Um, we had a number of former collectors who came out last summer and said to us, well, you're not going to find anything. There's nothing left. Um, and they didn't really understand that we were interested in the subsurface deposits, which are still uh, intact and in good shape. Um, but anyway, the, the Archaeological Conservancy purchased this land um, about a decade ago to try to um, preserve and protect what was left of it um, with the idea that then any data that we get from it, we can use for public outreach and public education. So um, this was kind of a dual you know, had a dual purpose here of training students, but also uh, creating data to educate the public and preserve <coughs> the site. Uh, just to uh, orient you physically, so the site is located in the state of Pennsylvania uh, in the U.S., so this is um, western Pennsylvania. Um, it's located on a second terrace of the Connemaw River, which is one of, um, it's a third order stream that is one of the larger watersheds in western Pennsylvania. Um, geologically, the uh, river is incising into uh, the valley. Uh, the bedrock geology here is the Glenshaw Formation, which consists um, of quartz sandstones. And, and I mentioned that because I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later in the result. So mostly sandstones here. Oops, there it is. Um, and the soils of the site are basically really well-drained sandy loams, great for excavating, um, pretty nice. Um, and they are formed in a <coughs> material of alluvial wash. Um, um, most of them coming from the, this Glenshaw sandstone. Uh, a little bit of cultural background, because I know we've been hearing a lot of uh, old world sites, so you're probably less familiar with some of these North American cultural traditions. So the Monongahela cultural tradition is what we would call late woodland uh, time period. So this is, um, you can see right here, about AD, uh, roughly 1000 AD to about 1600 AD. Um, there's about 400 of these sites known. They're uh, in western Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. Uh, essentially, they're focused on the Monongahela River watershed, and that's where the name comes from. Uh, the Monongahela folks were um, a sedentary uh, maize farmers. Uh, they often lived on first or second terraces uh, in these areas. Their villages are almost always circular and surrounded by a palisade with a plaza, uh, central plaza, uh, sometimes more than one plaza as the village would grow over time um, and expand. Their houses are also circular. Uh, so here's a close up of what one of those houses might have looked like. And what I wanna point out here, because it bears on our results, <coughs> is this little structure sticking out here. We call these pedal structures. Uh, they're actually storage pits that emerge from the edge of the house and you access it from the inside. Um, they're called pedal structures because um, what people would tend to do is over time build these pedals out from the center of the house. So I've seen houses where there's like up to two dozen of these storage pits around it. So it looks like pedals coming out uh, from a flower. Uh, just a real brief background on the site. Uh, it was first known and excavated in the 1950s. Um, by an amateur group that actually didn't do a bad job, um, but it was the 1950s, so not really up to our modern standards. Um, and this group was associated with uh, the Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology, which is an uh, amateur group that's still active today. Um, they collaborate uh, pretty closely with the professional group in Pennsylvania. The group that excavated this um, is no longer active, but the society as a whole is active. And so our plans for um, next summer is to get the society back engaged in this project and truly make it a public outreach and public education event uh, and bring people to the site. 
Um, unfortunately, from these early excavations, this is all we have. Um, this is just called a dark stain, um, so it's not very useful. We don't have field notes and we don't have any scaled maps. So our work in 2016 or last summer was really the first time we were getting good scaled uh, data out of this site. Um, we do have some donated collections from folks who collected it in the past and have now um, donated the collection. So these are some of the artifacts from the original excavations as well as some of the collectors. Um, diagnostic points, um, late Madison um, style triangular points, a lot of uh, bone beads, bone pendants, uh, shell beads, shell pendants, um, uh, cord marked and incised ceramics. Um, and we also, I couldn't find a picture of one, uh, but we've been told by the collectors, we haven't seen them, um, that there are polished hematite beads coming out of here. And I'll, I'll come back to those hematite beads uh, in a little bit. In 1977, the site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's a little ironic because we really know almost nothing about this site. Um, we know very little bit about the temporal affiliation, so that was one of our questions last summer. Um, we know very little about the internal organization of the site, so the arrangement of houses and stockades and plazas in relationship to one another. We know very little bit about that. Um, and most importantly, we know pretty much nothing about the paleo landscape or the paleo environment um, and human environmental interaction. Um, so that's kind of our, our goals was to, to really you know, give a justification for why this is on the, the National Register. Um, in approximately 2005, I actually forget the exact date, but thereabouts, um, the Archaeological Conservancy purchased the land, like I said, um, to try to protect it from looting, um, which was really getting out of control. Um, in fact, despite their efforts, it's still ongoing. Um, this is a picture that I took a few months after our field school, well, actually I guess about nine or ten months, um, not quite a full year. The Conservancy had put a fence around the, the boundary of the site. Um, very sturdy, nice fence, and somebody had come through and just systematically cut it with wire cutters, took it down, and oddly, for all that work, all they did was put in a little tiny hole. They took nothing. Um, luckily for us, the hole went into our backfill pile. <laughs> so, uh, no damage done, fortunately. Um, but, you know, so it's an ongoing problem. So the Conservancy is really eager to get some data out of here before we lose the intact subsurface deposits. Um, but also, again, their mission is to preserve and protect, so um, we're trying to find a balance between getting data um, but also preserving what's there. Um, so that kind of um, directed our research questions to a great extent, and so our overarching goal here was really to find a minimally invasive research design, uh, again, to maximize the data, but do as little um, invasive work as possible. And so, you know, geoarchaeology, of course, lends itself well to that. So we used a combination of geophysical survey um, and core, uh, auger coring, um, rather than large full-scale <coughs> trenching or test excavation. Our specific uh, research questions was one to confirm uh, this thing called this Johnston phase occupation. Um, which is between about 1450 and 1590. Um, more recent research at surrounding Monongahela sites has indicated that they're probably uh, multi-component, not single component, so we wanted to test that here. Um, and also look for the potential for older um, cultural occupations, even to the earlier woodland or, or the archaic. Um, so that was one of our goals. Um, and then, like I said, we know nothing about the, the past landscape or the environment, so we really wanted to focus on that. Uh, the time period we're looking at here is really the transition um, from the medieval warm period to the little ice age. So th there's been a lot of questions about, uh, people talk about the disappearance of the Monongahela. And so if we're gonna talk about you know, what happened to these groups and where they went, um, we need to understand the environment and the landscape. In 2013, uh, one of our graduate students at Indiana University of Pennsylvania did a small survey there as part of her master's thesis. Um, she did a gradiometer survey um, and came up with quite a few um, anomalies, most of them circular here. Uh, we suspect these are houses. Um, she did do some uh, minimal ground truthing, mostly soil probes, um, a little bit of test excavation, um, and basically found that you know, a lot of these areas were indeed associated with um, burned hearth areas. She had um, found some burial locations. Um, so definitely domestic context kinds of things. 
Um, so our 2016 work last summer was really building off of what uh, Lydia did. Um, so I'll talk briefly about our um, methodologies here. Um, so again, this is Lydia's gradiometer um, work, and so we're working off of that. Um, we decided to do a ground penetrating radar survey up in this northern area, um, in part because, and, and I think Lydia wanted to avoid dealing with this odd structure. <laughs> there's, most of them are round, but there's this kind of rectangular one. So we wanted to get some higher density data on that. Um, so we did a GPR survey um, of three 20 by 20 meter grids, um, doing passing transects about um, 25 centimeters um, so that's the students are working on that here. So again, trying to get high, high density data. We also did a, a lot of shovel testing, which is common in applied archaeology in the states. Um, basically, about 50 centimeter round shovel tests. Um, they're less invasive than a full scale, you know, unit test excavation. Um, give you a sense of the stratigraphy without um, moving as much dirt volumetrically. Um, so we did. Um, we excavated these every 10 meters up the eastern boundary of the site. This is the boundary of the Conservancy's property, um, up through the north, past the GPR survey area, and then down the west side, which is the edge of the terrace. Um, the reason for this, in large part, was because we suspect that the site extends beyond the Conservancy's boundaries. And so the Conservancy really wants to know, you know do we need to make an effort to purchase more land? Um, and, and if so, how far out do we have to go? Unfortunately, we didn't have landowner permission uh, to go further east or north, so that's hopefully something we can do uh, next summer. And then we also did some uh, coring with a bucket auger. Um, most of the time we uh, were using the auger here in the, in the shovel test because we were already 70 centimeters down, so that helps. Um, and so we have a number of cores from here uh, that I'll be showing you. And then finally, uh, we did do some test excavation, um, but we tried to keep it to a minimum. Uh, we worked with the Conservancy on this design, and uh, they allowed us six test units, uh, which actually they did, did later expand. Uh, but we started with these original six units. Um, and we placed these units over the uh, gradiometer anomalies. So some of them we put inside these circular structures, and some of them kind of cross-cutting uh, the outside in the hopes of getting post molds and, and uh, confirming that these are structures. Okay, so uh, looking at our results, um, the general stratigraphy, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, dark brown plow zone here, uh, loamy sand, uh, followed by subsoil, uh, um, sandy loam to loamy sands. Um, the depth to bedrock varied a bit um, across the site, so it ranged from about one and a half to slightly over two meters. Um, the bedrock, um, the original land surface there, is dipping uh, to the west and slightly north. The most common feature that we found were indeed post molds. That's what we were after, and we, we found lots of them. The students got tired of digging them. Um, here's three representative ones. We didn't get a lot of patterning um, because we were just in these small test units, so hopefully next summer we'll expand these a bit and try to see you know, what kind of patterning we have. Some of these test pits, uh, it's just one by one meter, but we had upwards of almost two dozen post molds. So um, quite a bit of post molds. There's probably several rebuilding episodes going on here. Um, and interestingly to us, there's a number of posts, um, younger posts that cross cut older posts. So that's helping confirm that there is more than one occupation here, more than just that Johnston phase. In the south end of the site, um, in addition to the post molds, you can see two of those larger post molds coming down from the Monongahela occupation here. <laughs> Something that we still have not answered is um, there's, it's probably a little hard to see where you're sitting, but there's a darker stain down here about 10 to 15 centimeters below the Monongahela occupation. Um, and these are kind of large, roughly U-shaped pits. It, they it go well beyond the boundaries of this test unit, so they're, they're large. They don't contain any ceramic or lithic. There's no cultural material of that type. But they do have two things. They have some very large um, chunks of charcoal, uh, lightly dispersed, but large pieces, um, especially towards the base. Um, and then sitting at the base of both of these pits that we found are these very large uh, sandstone blocks that don't appear to be worked. 
Um, we don't see any pitting on them or, or anything or any indication about what they might be used for. So these remain a mystery. We don't know um, what they date to. Unfortunately, uh, we took samples uh, for AMS dating, but we ran out of money to, to date these. Um, and we needed to prioritize the, the Monongahela occupation. So we know something's going on down here. And again, we'll probably have to uh, wait till next season to, to excavate that. Um, up in the north, so the, the opposite end of the site, this is where we found the most evidence for domestic structures. Um, so we have um, some of those petal-shaped um, storage pits that contained mostly uh, fire-cracked rock, surprisingly. Um, here's a picture of that rock. Um, all this rock is the Glenshaw sandstone that I mentioned, so they're using very local materials. Um, it's a, a fine-grained, well-cemented rock, and uh, one of my grad students has done some experimental work on this, and we found that these can be heated repeatedly um, four or five cycles at about 400 degrees before they start breaking down. So this was a, a handy local resource for them. Um, in terms of our C14 dates, um, these are Lydia's dates, these are our dates, and they do confirm the Johnston phase occupation. Uh, but we do have data now to su suggest that we have an earlier occupation and also a later one. Um, GPR results, um, apparently I'm short on time, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Um, but we got a, no a large number of these circular anomalies, lower, these are the lower slices. Um, this is the uppermost slice, and you can see them here and lower. We don't really see them between about 30 um, and 43 centimeters. Um, these are consistent with Monongahela size and shape. Um, what's interesting is our rectangular anomaly coming back to that original one that Lydia found. Um, we, we did get good data on it. Um, I know it's hard to see here, so this is Bill's interpreted um, version of it. It's about 35 meters long, about seven meters across really consistent with the size and shape of an Iroquois longhouse, which should not be here, um, but appears to be here. Um, so we'll be ground truthing this uh, next summer to confirm that that's what it is. Um, if that is what it is, this is really interesting because we've got an earlier occupation of just Monongahela houses, circular houses. Then we have this rectangular occupation um, along with the circular houses. So probably um, potentially other cultural groups uh, at the site. Um, the cores, um, what was interesting is we found a number of buried surfaces. Um, these are very thin, very ephemeral. Um, they pinch out to the south. We don't even see them in the south. Um, and they pinch out to the west. Um, so we just barely pick them up here. They, they're not here, but we see them here and here. Um, very uh, incipient pedogenesis. Um, we do see some alluvi uh, alluviated clay coatings. Um, but very little bioturbation, uh, little root activity. Um, so if these are, you know, true surfaces, if there's any cultural occupation here, it's probably very ephemeral. Um, we do see charcoal, um, very weathered, very small, but it doesn't seem to be a, um, associated with micro artifacts. So I've got one piece of shell, um, but I, you know, I can't say that that's cultural by any means. Um, if people were using these surfaces in prehistory prior to the Mon occupation, it was probably, like I said, very ephemeral, maybe just an overnight kind of a fishing expedition. Again, we don't see the surfaces to the south, um, but we do see unconformable contacts, um, graded bedding, some slaking crust and things like that, that do suggest um, that these may have been eroded. So the landform to the south may be less stable um, than to the north. Um, particle size analysis kind of supports that interpretation. So we see um, a coarsening upward sequence from bedrock to about 60 centimeters uh, below the surface, and then it finds. Um, so we're interpreting that as just lower velocity, uh, overbanked deposition, probably greater stability. And of course, that corresponds to the Monongahela occupation. <laughs> um, to the west, we see some wetlands, which it looks like I'm out of time to talk about, but I brought these thin sections with me, um, and I would love someone to uh, look at them with me who knows a little bit more about glade soils, but we do appear to have a paleo wetland uh, over here that's associated with uh, more cached rocks and also hematite nodules. So we're thinking maybe that they're processing hematite into beads over here where it's probably too wet really for living. Um, so that might be what's going on over here. Um, 
So I'm going to skip to our future research. <laughs> um, we want to ground truth the anomaly. Um, I've got a grad student right now um, expanding our core data so that we can um, investigate these buried landforms across the surface, get some um, paleotopography maps for these different landforms that are buried, um, date the charcoal, of course, and then um, eventually we want to do some geochemical analysis vertically down core, but also horizontally um, to get a better sense of the, the activity areas within the site. With that, I'll leave you with a picture of our crew peeking out through the vegetation there, and thank you for your attention.